we do just the, uh, the gospel for the feast of Saint Stephen the King and Saint Stephen of Hungary. Stand, I'll just read the gospel. We're going to stand for the gospel. So you guys, according to Saint Luke, chapter nineteen. At that time, Jesus spoke this parable to his disciples. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And calling his ten servants, he gave them ten pounds. And he said to them, Trade till I come. But his citizens hated him, and they sent an embassage after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that he returned, having received the kingdom. And he commanded his servants to be called to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And the first came, saying, Lord, thy, thy pound, that that hath gained ten pounds. And he said to them, Well done, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a little. Thou shalt have power over ten cities. The second came and said, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up what thou didst not lay down, and thou reapest which thou didst not sow. He said to him, Out of thy own mouth I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest, knewest, that I was an austere man, taking up what I laid not down, reaping that which I did not sow. And why then didst thou not give them my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have exacted it with usury? And he said to them that stood by, Take the pound away from him, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. But I say to you, to every one that hath shall be given, and he shall abound. From him that hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken from him. But for the word of today, holy God. To the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. Two considerations. This parable is confused sometimes over the other parable of the man with the ten talents and the five the five talents and the five talents, the two talents, and the one talent. And that is a separate parable about us trying to save our souls and do something for God. This parable is a separate one given shortly before our Lord Jesus Christ went to his crucifixion. And this, this parable, he says, that there was a man, a nobleman, that went into a country in order to obtain a kingdom. And that nobleman is our Lord Jesus Christ. He came from heaven to earth to obtain a kingdom. He came down to obtain a kingdom. When he went in, the servants that said, We do not want you to rule over us. We don't want you to be our ruler. And therefore, what did he say? Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the great missions of the gospel, the same Christ that said to his apostles, If you go into a city and they do not receive you, then wipe the dust off your feet and go to another city. And that same Christ said this, at that time, Jesus spoke this parable to his disciples, not to all men, but to his disciples. He's speaking to his priests. He's speaking to his bishops of the church. A certain nobleman went into a far country. He went from heaven all the way down to earth. That's a very far country. To receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Imagine the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ said these words. He is about to go to his crucifixion. He is about to go to Palm Sunday. He is about to show his glory before his apostles. It is, why am I here? I am here to establish a kingdom. And what are we supposed to do? The priest of God. The priest of God walks into a house. What is he supposed to say? My name is Padre Joe and I'm here to, can you, to visit you. No. He is supposed to say, the kingdom of heaven has arrived in this house. I don't travel as an individual into a house. It is the kingdom of heaven that arrives in the house. The kingdom of heaven has come upon us. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is a nobleman who came from heaven down to the earth to attach, a, a gain a kingdom. 
And what happened when he came to the earth? And calling his ten servants gave them ten pounds and said to them, Trade till I come. But his citizens hated him. And they hated him very much. And here he's speaking to his apostles. I am going to the city of Jerusalem. They hate me. I am here on this earth. They hate me. All the citizens that are the children of Adam, they hate me. His citizens hate him. Does that mean he's going to wipe the dust off his feet? No. His citizens hated him, and they sent an image to him after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that he returned, having received the kingdom, and he commanded his servants to see what they did with the money. He told his ten servants, You watch this place, and I am going to go to a kingdom, and I'm going to reestablish my kingdom. I will not accept that I shall not reign. And here we must understand, right now we're in the United States of America, which was founded on Masonic principles and not on the principles of Christ, which is now being whatever is Christ in our country is being ripped out of it completely. Well, why are we here? Bishop Dagger John Hughes said it very well in the 1840s when he was building the, the St. Patrick's Cathedral before it was constructed. In the 1848 time of the Know-Nothing Riots, where they were killing Catholics, and what did Bishop Dagger John Hughes say? I am the Bishop of New York City. I am hearing people say that we Catholics are here to be good citizens in the United States. And they are saying that there are rumors that we are Papists and we are Catholics and we are coming to conquer this country. And I want it to be known I am tired of hearing about these rumors. They are not rumors, it's a fact. And I don't want to hear anything about them being rumors. Because we are here to conquer this country for Christ. That's what we're here for. The bishop came into New York City to establish a kingdom. And as Bishop Dagger John Hughes you mentioned many times during the time of the Know Nothing riots, they were going to, they were, the Know Nothings were killing the Catholics in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Louisville, Kentucky, my hometown, and in other places, killing Catholics. New York City, there were more Catholics, but not one was harmed. After they killed the Catholics in Philadelphia, killed the Catholics in Louisville, and burnt down the churches, and not one man was arrested, Bishop Dagger John Hughes, the Bishop of New York City, he went to the mayor of New York City, and he said, Mayor, I came to speak to you about these know-nothing riots. What did the mayor say? He said, I know nothing. And that was a code word. They were called the know-nothings because when they said, I know nothing. That meant no arrest, no punishment. They even became a know nothing party. It's now called the Democrat Party. They became the know nothing party. And the know nothings were enemies of the church. But St. Bad Bishop Hughes went to the, to, to the Bishop of New York City, the mayor of New York City, and he said, I want to speak to you about the know nothing riots, the killings in Philadelphia, the killings in Louisville, Kentucky, the burning down of churches, the killing of innocent Catholics, and no one going to justice because of it. I know nothing. And Bishop Hughes says, I know that you know nothing. I am not here to speak to you about what you know or to ask you what you know. I am a bishop of the church, and I am coming to tell you what I know. And what I know is this. If one rock goes through one window in New York City, if one of my Catholic, Irish, or German, Italian Catholics, is, German Catholics is touched, I will take all the Catholics in New York City, and we're going to burn New York City to the ground. Just thought you might want to know. Bye, Mayor. And he walked out. And not one rock went through one stained glass window. Not one Catholic was harmed. Because the bishop defended his flock. And because he recognized we are here to establish a kingdom. Why is a Catholic in New Jersey? Why is a Catholic in the United States? Why is he in Africa? Why is he in China? Why is he in Antarctica? Why is he in the North Pole? In order to bring Jesus Christ to rule in every place. Because we're here to establish a kingdom. And we recognize when we go to establish this kingdom... And there will be many enemies that do not want this kingdom to be established. That is why the Catholic saints went. Stephen was the pagan king of Hungary. He did not believe in God. He did not know God. He did not love God. 
But the missionary saints went to him and said, Stephen, you must know, love, and serve God. And you must believe in God. And if you believe in God and you go to the true God and you get baptized, you enter the true Holy Roman Catholic Church, you will be a real king. And as a king, what must you do? Take all your people and get them all baptized. Take all your people and make them all Catholic and bring this whole country to God that it might be saved. And Stephen was baptized. And Stephen brought his whole country to Christ. That's what the duty of a king to do is. A duty of a king is. We are now in a time in which the, the, the enemies of God are about to completely destroy and topple our country. It is worthy of being toppled because of our sins. However, we are in the hands of God, in the hands of Blessed Virgin Mary. This country was this country was, was consecrated, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and the, the Immaculate Conception, and that the and that the whole of the new world from top to bottom was consecrated, the Immaculate Conception. When the Blessed Virgin Mary came in 1531 on December the 12th and told Juan Diego, told Juan Bernardino, the uncle of Juan Diego, he, he told Juan, Juan Bernardino that your, your nephew has just seen my, the, 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 me, the image you see in front of you, is now imprinted on a tilma of Juan Diego. And later this day, the Bishop of Mexico, back two bishops of Mexico, are going to come, and, and priests are going to come to your very house, because you were very ill, and you took away the illness of Juan Bernardino. He was near death, being, being shot by arrows by the enemies of God. And he was cured. And I want you to tell them who I am. You will tell them you already know about the vision. You will tell them you already saw my Tilma. And you, Juan Bernardino, will tell them who I am. I am Ketelote. I am she who crushes the serpent's head. That's who I am. Tell them who I am. And so when they came, she said, I, I spoke to the mother of God. And she said, Ketelote. That, he, that she is the one who crushes out of the serpent, and she is here to conquer this land for Christ. And, the, and the, the letter P and Q are hard to pronounce in their language. And so the Spanish thought they were trying to say Guadalupe. Thought they were trying to say Guadalupe, and so they called her Our Lady of Guadalupe. But Guadalupe, in the meaning of the, in the, in the Aztec language, means the one that crushes the head of the serpent. It means the Immaculate Conception. And what does she do when she's pure? What does she do in her cleanness? She crushes the head of the serpent. And what is her power? Her power is in her Hail Mary. We had a small miracle of the Hail Mary just a few years ago. Small miracle of the Hail Mary a few years ago when a pilot uh, was taking off from New York City and LaGuardia Airport in I think 2006 or 7 or 8. And his Plajet ran into a flock of geese and both engines went out. And he turned the plane and landed in the Hudson. It's called the Miracle on the Hudson. He turned the plane. He had no time to turn the plane, land back in the airport. He said, I'll have to land it in the Hudson. He turned it towards the Hudson. And he said after he landed, he said, what did you do? He said, well, I had only time for one Hail Mary. That's all. For one Hail Mary. As the plane turned, he said, one Hail Mary. And at the end of that Hail Mary, he landed in the Hudson River. And not one person on that plane was hurt. Not one person got wet. There was no damage to anyone on that plane. It crashed in the Hudson River. And it just happens there were a bunch of boats out that day, and they all walked on the wing and got into the boats, and everyone was saved by one Hail Mary. And for the first time in the history of America, our country that is Protestant, our country that is, that is spoken since his Protestant foundation against the Blessed Virgin Mary, and has only tolerated the Catholic faith. For the first time in the history of our country, during the Republican National Convention just a few days ago, the Ave Maria, one Hail Mary, was sung. And President Trump had that Hail Mary sung, that he's not a Catholic. And his wife, that's not his wife, Melania, his third wife, she would have been the one to make that, that Hail Mary be sung. And that Ave Maria was sung before all of our people. And there must have been many, many souls throughout the whole of America cringing in anger and hatred. Because the president was having the Ave Maria sung one time. And it was sung in the name of our country. And it was sung in the presence of our, in the presence of our president. And this 
is the power against the enemies of God. They want to destroy everything. And maybe Our Lady will give us a small reprieve. And maybe there will be a little bit of a reduction of the chastisement that we deserve because of the power of one Hail Mary. When you say Hail Mary, it's a beautiful thing. When I say Hail Mary, it's a beautiful thing. But when the president of the country commands the Hail Mary to be sung, and in his name and the name of all the country that Ave Maria is sung, it has a special power. And the Blessed Virgin Mary will pay attention to that. One pilot a couple years ago only said one Hail Mary, and 300 people were saved who should have been killed, who should be dead because of the Hail Mary. And so we must have confidence in Our Lady. We know the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary is what's going to come. The Blessed Virgin Mary is going to crush the head of the serpent. She is going to completely destroy Satan. But what is it? What does she want? She wants her son to be king. Remember that Catherine de' Medici. Catherine de' Medici, she wanted her three sons to be kings. And so they became kings. She wanted the best for her sons to be a king. The Blessed Virgin Mary, her son is king. Her son is the king of kings. And she only accepts him as the king of kings. She wants that son to be the king of kings and lord of lords and rule every single nation and all peoples. And she will make sure that it happens. She is going to have her great victory. And remember what she said. She said it multiple times that Our Lady of Fatima, when she spoke at Fatima, and also Trump held the statue of Lady of Fatima a little while ago. And, and when had the mother of Fatima in his hands. And though he is a weak sinner, and though he is not perfect, who holds Mary in his hands can count on blessings. And who has the Ave Maria sung can count on blessings. And these blessings are more powerful than all, all the attacks of Satan and Hillary before she gets the privilege of going to hell for all eternity, and Obama and all those other scumbags and pigs who are trying to destroy our entire country and destroy the world and bring it to the reign of the Antichrist. They shall be destroyed. They shall be destroyed. They're old and dying now, and they shall be eternally dead and eternally forgotten and eternally miserable, and they shall be defeated by the foot of the Blessed Virgin Mary while she's washing the dishes. She's washing the dishes. Oh, there's George Soros. Oh, there's uh, Bill Gates. Oh, there's the other followers of Satan. Oh, there's the Rothschilds. Let me just finish mm -hmm. this dish real quick. <laughs> Exit the devil. She doesn't have to have a workout program. She doesn't have to join the gym. She doesn't have to pull out a sword. She just lifts her foot in between washing dishes, in between cooking breakfast for her son, in between cleaning the room, in between speaking to John about the things of God. And she lifts her foot and drops it in one second, and there is a dialogue with the devil. It sounds like this. <laughs> And he is dead, and he is wiped out, and he is finished. We must remember that we are in a great battle in which the Blessed Virgin Mary is going to have her victory. And it is a great blessing to our country that our president had the Hail Mary sung once. May heaven listen to that Hail Mary, and may we receive a reprieve from the wickedness of these stupid masks, the wickedness of of our country being destroyed. We are worthy of destruction. We are worthy of being thrown in the streets. We are worthy of total being being wiped out. We deserve nothing else. But our president had a Hail Mary son. And we love Mary. And we're sorry for our sins. And we know that we're worthy of destruction. And we have not, we cannot complain about it. If they come to tear down our houses, we have no right to complain. If they take away our business, we have no right to complain. If they drive us in the streets, we deserve it. But we have confidence in Mary, and we have confidence in the mercy of her divine Son, and that we are here to help our Lord Jesus Christ insofar as we can. And he wants us to be instruments to help his Holy Mother to establish a kingdom in places where he does not wish to, do not wish him to rule. He doesn't care they don't wish him to rule. We want him to rule, and we're going to convert hearts that they come back to our Lord Jesus Christ, that he has a kingdom. And hence on this day, we have St. Stephen, the king. He was a pagan, and he became a saint. So let's pray that Trump 
who is not of God can also become a saint and be a true instrument of bringing our kingdom of the United States to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he can have our country consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He can have it consecrated to the Sacred Heart. He can obey heaven, even though Pope Francis doesn't know how to do that. Maybe he can teach Pope Francis how to do that. Pope Francis hates Trump. That's always a good sign. And the fact is that, what is it? We must stand for the holy truth, wait, wait for our kingdom to be, our country to be converted, and then there'll be a conversion of the Holy Father, and then the Holy Father will listen to heaven, and will consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and when Russia is converted, that is when the whole world will be converted. And must pray for that conversion of Russia, pray for the Pope to finally do his duty, and consecrate Russia in the union with all the bishops of the church, and now that Russia might be converted, and the victory of Mary may come. In the meantime, we pray for a small reprieve, a little blessing, a small reprieve from the, from the hands of heaven, because our president had one Hail Mary sung in the name of our country. Really bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.